I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting. Welcome the good crowd. Good to see you guys. Um, as for roll call though. Chairman Lloyd. Here. Vice Chairman Thomas. Here. Chairman Ballard. Here. Commissioner Langworthy. Here. Commissioner Strong. Here. All present. All right. Please stand for the flag salute. <clears throat> Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now is the time for public comments that are comments that are not on the agenda. Do we have any public comment? Oh. I have none, Chair. All right. That moves us to approval of the agenda. Chair, I have a, just a question for the Commission. Okay. Um, I don't know how many folks are here on item 2.1, the code amendment regarding cannabis. Can you raise your hands if you're here for that? No, no. Okay. Yes. Then I'd like to make a recommendation, Chair, to take item 3.1 before 2.1, which is the Wildemar Meadows G Pit. That's okay with the Commission. I have no problem with that. We will trade places with them. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the change of 2.1 and 3.1 swapping places. Second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Moves us to approval of the consent calendar. <clears throat> I move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five vote. Gets us to 3.1. I need to uh, recuse myself from this since I live in close proximity, but I will be remaining in the audience today. Very good. Just like while we get the PowerPoint loaded up. Okay, item 3.1, this is a um, general plan amendment initiation process for the public. Uh, I know the commission is familiar with this. The GPIP process is part of our pre-application review. This is not a formal public hearing. There will be no decisions made tonight, no actions taken by the commission or recommendations to the city council, other than they will provide comments to the city council uh, next month when this particular pre-op goes to the city council for review. Everyone's comments out in the audience will also be part of that packet that will go to council uh, next month. So the applicant, Mr. Lundy, has submitted this pre-op as part of the city's GPIT process uh, he proposes to amend the general plan land use map as part of the proposed specific plan amendment to the farm specific plan. Uh, the formal project in the future would also require a GPA zone change, specific plan amendment, tentative track map, and environmental impact report. There will be community meetings and interagency coordination. Uh, that will be a key component of that process. In fact, we've already started that process with some of our adjacent cities. This shows a larger vicinity map. Uh, you can see the upper area in the left blue lines is the current farm specific plan area. And then the project site is the remaining undeveloped uh, specific plan area. Uh, several of the commissioners will remember that Oak Creek Canyon specific plan amendment uh, was reviewed by the commission and approved by city council several years ago. That was one of the other vacant areas uh, within the farm specific plan. So this shows the existing land use designations. Um, I don't know if I exhibit small. So 
So under the current general plan, there's a mix of medium density residential, low density residential, uh, very low density residential, estate density residential, and some rural mountainous designations as you can see by the various colors there. So this slide kind of gives you just a brief indication that the number of acres and number of units that are anticipated under the current uh, plan, general plan, and the uh, current farm specific plan. That's about 1,200 uh, units, give or take, with on 7,200 or 792 acres. So the new land use designations proposed by the applicant would allow about 2,000 or plus dwelling units on the same acreage and broken down as follows. Now, I want to just point out that these are a preliminary set of numbers as we go through the development review process and EIR process, especially with regard to bio and habitat conservation areas, that number could go, could go down. But she has uh, about 234 acres designated for medium density residential, uh, 190 acres for medium high density, and then the rest open space, conservation, recreation, and some water course areas. So some of the preliminary staff observations on this is that a southern road extension along the western portion of the site is critical for primary and secondary emergency vehicle access, including uh, fire and police. Uh, the applicant has a PowerPoint presentation, which will have some other good exhibits to show the commission and the public. The applicant has begun discussions with the regional or Riverside Conservation Agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Cal Fish and Wildlife regarding that southern road extension through some of their lands. Uh, some other issues, the design of widening the Sunset Avenue from Bundy into the project is important. Traffic impacts will have to be evaluated as part of the EIR. Uh, potential school impacts, the Elsinore uh, Unified School District, and the need for a fiscal impact analysis as part of the specific plan. And there's more that I've enumerated in the staff report, but I wanted to just highlight some of the primary ones here in the presentation. So our recommendation tonight is to receive public testimony from the applicant. Uh, he'll come up after I'm done if you don't have any questions for me. And then we'll open up uh, for public input and comments. Uh, and then the directions to discuss the land use and planning issues related to this GPIP. And then forward your comments to City Council for consideration, which we have set right now for November 14th. That concludes my presentation. I'll happy to answer any questions. Do we have, does the applicant present? Would you like to speak? Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I'm actually not the applicant. I'm the applicant's representative. Uh, my name is Joel Morse. I'm the principal of TMB Planning, 17542 East 17th Street, Testing California. Um, okay, so I'm looking over my shoulder. Great, okay. Um, I'll, uh, I'll dance through it. Uh, so I have a short presentation just to highlight some of the uh, key issues. Um, Mr. Bassey present, presented the majority of the issues, so we'll go through it pretty quickly. Is there a way for me to advance, or Matthews, who does ASO? Ah, so. And then we're here to answer any questions we can if, as we go through this. Awesome. You saw this picture, and again, the general plan designation would only uh, impact the uh, southern portion of the farm and an additional 80 acre piece, which is that portion that is not shaded but was, is surrounded by yellow. So it's a portion of the farm plus an additional 80 acres. And just a little close-up of that. And what I wanted to point out uh, in the general plan <coughs> amendment, the designations that would be proposed as part of the Waldemar Meadows project, if you look at the colors related to the proposed colors uh, in the outlined area of the map and you, relate, and you look at those compared to what's already in the approved farm, you see that really what we're proposing is similar general plan land uses to what's already within the approved farm. Also important to, to see here is the along the southern boundary and the western boundary, 
uh, there's those light colored green colors, those are all open space and a dark green along the north east corner and in the center are all open space as well. <laughs> that centerpiece uh, is a 42 acre park. This is a preliminary land use plan and this is where we derive the number of units that Mr. Bassey mentioned. It's very preliminary, just really just us getting an idea of what we might like to do. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that it is a starting point and we do not, we do not anticipate this number of units at the end of the day. So we're, we look forward to working with the community, the commission, and the city staff to work out whatever works best for the city and the project. Given the site's constraints, again, we don't expect to achieve all of these units. So what I'm often asked and when we come to these uh, specific plan amendments and the general plan amendments, particularly with amendments to specific plans, is, you know, what's the reason that you want to amend the specific plan? And for this project, the, real, the main reason is to modernize the plan. It's a 44-year-old specific plan. And while it, portions of it have been developed, this portion has not been developed. It's the applicant's opinion that, that the reason for that is it's really not consistent with what today's uh, homeowners are looking for, and that a modernization of the plan is appropriate at this point in time. It will accommodate a wider range of housing types, and again, types current, and housing types and product types that are more uh, marketable in today's environment. One of the considerations that we have right now for the plan is an active adult portion of the community. Uh, again, this is all part of the planning process still for us, but it is one of the considerations that we have right now. Um, in looking at the benefits of the GPA and the specific plan amendment, the key thing here and one of the modernization aspects is the clustering of the development off of the more steep and less developable areas of the plan. The, um, uh, existing plan really proposes development across the entire space. Here we've clustered the development in the more developable areas and are consciously leaving those open space areas in big chunks of acreage to be left in perpetuity. Um, it's better suited for the proportions of the site and we can create those large open spaces. The project will also create upgraded roads, water, sewer, storm drain infrastructure, create a 42-acre park, and finally, the biggest benefit of the proposed GPA is the ability to create the improved access to Clinton Keith Road. Oops. So this, this uh, slide here demonstrates the advantage of the southerly access, and I want to emphasize that, as Mr. Bassey did, that the southerly access is intended to be and will be, is designed and is intended to be the primary access point for this for Wildemar Meadows project. There are a number of access points through the farm. Only two will remain at the end of the planning process as far as we're concerned. Uh, so the other streets will be closed off and there would not be access to the farm except for in two locations needed for emergency access and general uh, circulation. So the advantage of this southerly route, as you can see, if you look at the slide right now and you look to the north, you see the blue line. That blue line is the current route that people have to take to get to Ronald Reagan Elementary School or to the medical center down on Clinton Keith. And if you look at the green line, that is the reduced or shortened distance for access to those same two locations. Significant difference, um, upwards of eight to ten minutes and six to eight mile differences in the drive, in the drive distance and in the drive times. So it's a significant advantage, uh, obviously, for people needing to go to the medical center and people driving their kids to school. And also, this allows uh, folks to avoid getting on 15 freeway. No freeway requirement for these southern route. So it's a tremendous advantage that way. It will also reduce travel time to the commercial uh, facilities, commercial enterprises and services along Clinton Keith Road. So it is a substantial advantage and it is a primary part of the project. It's a key component of the project. Another key component, another big advantage of that southern access is to improve fire response times. Uh, so right now with the current access through sunset uh, into the farm that's the only real access in there, uh, then fire response, response times are all from the north and have limited opportunities for the different stations 
We understand that there's a new station that's going to be built somewhere in that southwest area along Clinton Keith somewhere. We're not exactly sure. I'm not sure personally where it's going to be. But if it is along Clinton Keith, of course, it will improve the drive times and the response times for the fire department for both medical and fire emergencies. So um, before I conclude, I want to acknowledge that we have received one letter from uh, the public. And we appreciate that, one of the residents of the farm. Uh, we look forward to, as part of the process, meeting with the farm residents to talk about what they would like to see, how we can accommodate their concerns, and move the project forward with, with your recommendation to the, to the City Council. Thank you very much. We stand ready to answer any questions if, that you might have. Council, like to ask questions or move to Citizens First. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have public speakers? Yes, Chair. First, we have Mr. George Taylor with donated time by Gail Taylor for a total of six minutes. I assume you all got my <clears throat> environmental impact letter. Uh, it will take me over ten minutes to read it, so I prepared some bullet points that are more current. Also, there's one for you, Alfredo. Thank you, sir. And then I give uh, everybody but uh, Thomas and Social gets one. for Dan down here, too. Here. Thank you. Uh, you'll forgive me if I don't look at you while I read this, but I only have six minutes to do it, so I'm going to read it. Okay. Okay. All right. You ready? Yep. Yeah. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, I was going to say Tom, but you didn't look like Tom. <laughs> Staff, and uh, audience. My name is George Taylor. I have been a resident of the farm in Wildemar since 1986, prior to my retirement from the County of San Bernardino in 2003. I'm speaking this evening as a private resident of the city, representing myself to identify what I believe will be primary impacts that I know will be hurdles to be mitigated before all of us will be able to uh, live as good neighbors down the road. I'm not opposed to this project or the development as long as the results of a comprehensive environmental impact report causes the mitigation of the problems that will surround the project. Uh, the following statistics that you just got uh, represent, yeah, represent what's in place now, this day. The, statistic, the statistics that were in the letter that you already got uh, were from amendment number three of the specific plan. And uh, things changed since those statistics got there. So, anyway, I will start with uh, some comparisons uh, in the build out at the farm community versus the yet to be built Wildemar Meadows. Uh, in the farm, we have 1,285 lots on 570 acres. Uh, the proposal for this project is 2,064 lots on 425 acres. The EDU for the farm is approximately two. Uh, EDU per acre, and uh, it's my understanding this project wants 4.87 uh, EDU per acre. Uh, we have three swimming pools and other amenities on 149 acres up at the farm. Open space recreation is 162 for this project, which are unknown uh, as to what the plans to put in that park. Uh, what I consider is low density at the farm, and as stated in the uh, proposal is medium uh, density uh, residential and a medium high density residential uh, for the Wildemar Meadows project. I took a lot of the statistics out of the uh, Department of Real Estate public reports for our tracks as they were finally built. So these figures for the farm were more accurate than what was in specific plan three, or amendment three. Density questions. <clears throat> Uh, what will be the lot size at this density for 2064 residences? I understand you make a letter. Uh, this is a, 
Uh, is there a track map available for the project? Are these single family homes, condos, townhouses, or conventional stick built homes? Uh, is the 4.8 per acre what is really planned? Uh, are these homes approximately 1,900 square feet in size? And what buffering does the developer plan between this project and, and our farm community? As far as water is concerned, who's planned to be the water provider for this project? Sewer. Uh, the Farm Mutual Water Company provides sewer service for the farm community independent of EVMWD. Question. Is the 12-inch diameter sewer pipe planned for the Oak Creek Canyon tract large enough to support the 2,064 more residents if this developer plans to connect to it? Egress and ingress. I'm opposed to the use of Farm Road, Harvest Way, and Harvest Way East by this developer for the following reasons. The farm streets have no sidewalks and no street lights. The farm streets have only a pole light in front of each residential lot for illumination. The majority of the farm population is younger families with children. When it started it was older, but now it's younger. Uh, the width of the farm roads appear to follow road standards 105 and 106, and that is access in local streets that weren't designed to carry high volume traffic. These streets are owned by the city. The city farm is not a gated community. The speed limit on these streets is 25 miles an hour. There is no traffic signal at Harvest Way and Bundy Canyon Road. There is no traffic signal at Harvest Way East and Bundy Canyon Road. There is a traffic signal at the Farm Road in Bundy. Uh, Sunset Road further impacts uh, uh, the Bundy Canyon Road. The best recommendation is to coordinate with BLM for egress and ingress from and to Baxter or George <laughs> Porras Roads near Clinton Keith to the southwest. I'm impressed that he's already tried to do that. Uh, if you're aware as you're aware, Bundy Canyon uh, is a two-lane winding mountain road arterial between the I-15 and the 215. The only ingress and egress for the farm residents to go and come from work. The only way to get medical help at the farm if needed. The only way to stop, get food, and meet appointments. The only way to transport farm children to, to and from school. The only way to get fire service to the farm. The only way to evacuate in the event of a disaster, we live in a, far, uh, a zone four high fire designated area. Uh, add 4,000 more vehicles, which most families have more than one vehicle, uh, to this already congested roadway before it is widened would make a bad situation worse. This roadway has caused traffic injuries, the roadway has <coughs> caused traffic accident deaths, and this roadway has caused off-road property damage. The roadway carries caravans of cars in the morning and the evening rush hours. This roadway carries moderate truck traffic during the day. A widening project is, a, is, the, is in the planning at a cost of $40 million, and there's a $10 million shortfall. The developer of this project needs to contribute if the in and out is on Bundy Canyon. The best recommendation is that the developer should coordinate with and convince the BLM it would be of the best, better interest for safety and for the better good of the community and the residents of the farm to obtain a right of way to go southwest into Wildemar. Thank you for your time. Remember these environmental problems. I hope you all read the, a lot of that. And uh, I thank you very much, George Taylor. Thank you, George. Yes. <laughs> If you agree with the speaker, just put your hand up. Thank you. Michelle Thomas. Good evening, commissioners. Um, for the record, I am speaking tonight as a resident and not as a commissioner. Um, I was fully aware when I purchased my home two houses from the proposed project area that development would happen. I do have a few issues and one thing I am pleased to see, um, I do support the opening 
of Sunset Avenue and or the access to Sunset Avenue and bringing access to Clinton Keith. This is a safety concern for all residents of the farm. I don't know that there's a single resident that hasn't been stuck on Bundy Canyon for an extended period of time due to an accident that has closed all access to our homes. I can only imagine if a, fire, a wildfire were to block access to Bundy Canyon, what the evacuation process would look like. Knowing that a good portion of our residents are elderly, this access would also ease traffic on Bundy Canyon, allowing many of us a direct route to take our kids to school or access to stores and restaurants, as well as Inland Valley Hospital and medical offices. I don't think this project can possibly move forward, though, without disassociating from the Farm Mutual Water Company. The Farm Mutual Water Company only produces 5% of water to the existing shareholders from their wells. The rest is purchased from EVMWD at a Tier 2 rate. The Farm Mutual Water Company arguably uses a very outdated system to treat wastewater. I feel that this system barely services the existing shareholders, and the possibility of adding 2,000 more flushing toilets makes me ex extremely fearful for the residents that live close, in close proximity to their spray field. The Farm Mutual Water Company also uses an old-fashioned meter rating system. They do not have manpower or service for these new homes and therefore is vulnerable to human and system error. I also feel that the designation of medium to high density housing backed up to existing housing with a medium density designation is not only grossly misplaced, but an eyesore. Many of the homes on the outer rim of the farm there are half acre lots. Many of the existing homes on the Menifee size are estate or small farm lots. I would estimate that 85% of homes in the farm have a common or green belt area behind them. It is one of the beauties of our neighborhood and that I look out my door every day and my backyard is open space. I do not look at my neighbor's house. I don't look at my neighbor's yard. This contributes to a beautiful rural look and feel to our homes and neighborhood. I do understand that this area will eventually be developed but I feel that Wildemar Meadows project needs considerable modification before it can move forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Ken Mays. I have a couple of comments. Uh, the developer is under the impression that there will be a fire station, a new fire station built in Wildemar. There's no land set aside for such a fire station, and there's no money to build it. If the city plans to build a fire station on Quimby paid for parkland, it will result in a lawsuit. I'd also like to know what the width of the southern route out of there is supposed to be. Is it going to be two lanes, four lanes, six lanes? And it's also important that the parkland, that the 42 acre parkland is graded with utilities and it's it, within two utilities installed, if not fully developed. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. That is all, Chair. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. <clears throat> Does anybody else want to speak that didn't fill out a form? No? Just want to check. Thank you. We do have a hand. I think one of the main comes. Come on, too. <laughs> and then you'll have to fill out a form afterwards, just okay. so we've got it. I just think one of the main concerns. Well, hi, everybody. I don't know how to address you. Thank you. Um, I think one of our main concerns as farm residents is, like Michelle said, our water system is barely holding us together. And also, our main three roads have very few stop signs in them. It is a younger community. I have dogs, most of us have kids, you know, things like that, and we don't have street lights. So we just wanna make sure that the roadways aren't going to have a very copious amount of, you know, I guess tractors and trucks and everything of all these building supplies coming through day and night. Because not only will it be a noise disturbance, but for us, it's gonna cause a ton more traffic 
and it's going to cause a lot of dangers for people who walk their dogs. You know, I go to walk on a walk every night, you know, and sometimes it's very hard with the cars on both sides. Already we have a more narrow street. So I think that's just a main concern for us, is we really just want to make sure that our three streets aren't going to be the main roads to this construction and that our safety is a pressure. Thank you very much. Okay. I'd like to ask if the developer would come up and possibly answer some of these questions. Once again, Joel Morse with TMB Planning. Um, everybody's brought up some good comments. I actually wanted to raise my hand as well. <laughs> and I say that in all serious, seriousness because where we are in this, where we are right now with the Commission and with the City Council, with the GPIP, is really looking for uh, your uh, nod to say, yes, go explore this further. And to be honest, the we don't have the answers to a lot of the questions that, that folks have asked. I think the buffering question that Ms. both Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor brought up and Ms. Uh, Thomas brought up, Commissioner Thomas brought up, are good questions that we, I don't know that we've really looked at it in detail yet, but we certainly will now. And that's what the benefit of hearing from folks are. Um, Bundy Canyon Road, uh, I don't know at this point what the traffic study is going to say about needing to widen that. I want to reassure everybody that the, the goal of this project is to bring access through Sunset through the, back, through the south from Clinton Keith Road. That is the basis of this project. And that anything going north of north on Sunset to Bundy Canyon is not intended, back up, from Bundy Canyon south is not intended as a, as a primary access. And the primary access is from the south from Sunset. Um, as far as the water company issue, frankly, I don't know anything about that yet. We haven't gotten that far, uh, but it's a good point. And I, if I misspoke about the fire station, I apologize. I see it on the map that I had, so I made the assumption that it was uh, something that was going to happen. Um, I do want to talk about the 42-acre park. It is intended to be a, to be a developed park, not a, not a uh, passive park. I can't tell you at the moment exactly what amenities will be there. We'll develop that as we move through the specific plan process, but it will be a fully, uh, I'm sorry, it will be a fully amenitized park. Uh, and then the remaining open space around the perimeter is the really rough uh, topography, which won't be developed at all. <clears throat> um, the construction of again talking about the street stop signs and the street lights on on within the farm itself. Again, that's something that um, as we get further into the, the process of figuring out how this project might be built, we'll need to revisit all of those things. We don't have any of the answers for that stuff at this point, quite honestly. Uh, but the fact that folks are concerned about it, that's important to us. And as we go through the process, we will be meeting with the community to hear all this and to talk about all this in more detail. But for tonight, all we're really looking from the commission is, hey, go explore this a little further. And we're going to come back here uh, with a specific plan, with all the entitlements. Uh, we'll be working with staff to work through some of these pro some of the details, all the details actually. Uh, we'll be working with the community to work through the details, and that process will go on over the next year or more. There'll be an environmental impact report, which will technically analyze some of the questions folks asked tonight, particularly about the water company, whether that's. Uh, Adequate, which sounds like it's not to me. As, as not an, I'm not an engineer, but it certainly sounds to me like it's not adequate. And so, uh, the, the traffic, exactly what's going to be needed on Bundy Canyon Road, exactly what's go, what with Sunset will be uh, to Clinton Keith. All of that will be determined through the traffic study as part of the EIR, which again you will see, the public will see, have an opportunity to comment on. This is very early days in the project, and really again. All we're looking for is a nod to say yes. We think you should. There's some there's some validity to this idea. Move forward and let's see what you have to. Let's show us something as we as you get further into the process. Okay. Anyone have any questions for the applicant? I've got a couple. Okay. Great. Um, 
You mentioned that this will be mostly disconnected from the farm with just one or two access points. Other than that, the main traffic goes through the two other directions, down to Bundy and down to towards Baxter. Correct. Um, does that mean this is not part of the farm, or is this still to be considered part of the farm? It's part of the farm specific plan, uh, and it, there will be some connectivity to the farm itself, but it's, I mean, I, it's hard to say what you exactly mean by that. It will be part of the specific plan. It's going to be a different neighborhood than the farm itself. It's going to have a different tone, different texture. Uh, so in that sense, it's a different neighborhood. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but it's... Well, one of the concerns was that there's minimal swimming pools for the amount of people they have now, and if you get an extra 8,000 people trying to use their three little swimming pools, that it would be a, a negative impact. Oh, gotcha. Uh, at the moment, it's not intended that the residents of Wildmore Meadows will be using the facilities at the farm. That's not the current thinking of the project, and I don't expect that to change. Okay. We wouldn't expect to, to overload that. So that's the point of that 42-acre 40, I mean, 42 park's a pretty big park. Mm -hmm. So we expect to have uh, significant <laughs> facilities for our residents. Now, whether, whether reciprocally, farm residents might come and use the pool on the 42-acre park, that I don't know the answer to that one yet at all. Okay. Any questions? I do have, I do have a few questions. Um, first, on the um, proposed uh, general plan land use designation exhibit, I'll pray if you could put that map up. Yeah, that one. Um, the roads that you have there uh, seem to dead end rather than loop. That is a high fire area, and I am all about options for getting out as far as um, will that road, you know, I know this is just a rough idea, but that it would loop around so that if you can't jog left, you can jog right. Um, yeah, it, it's a little misleading, this type of a land use plan, because it only shows the backbone infrastructure. It only shows the back, the, the large roads. Mm -hmm. It doesn't show the in-neighborhood roads that would connect these large roads. So, yes, they're all, it's all looped. It's required to be looped in, in, in all, you know, uh, high fire hazard areas, and so they would be. Okay, it's so the, at this level. that's just showing a, a really large arterial road. That's then. all it's showing is the arterial. Okay, and then um, is there any plan for any kind of amenities uh, like a, a equestrian center or a, a store or something that's up the hill for, oh, mom, we just drank all the milk. Do you have, you know, I can't ride my bike down to the store. Um, is that at all in the plans for? At this point, there is no plan, so theoretically it could be. Okay. I mean, again, we're very, very early days. We haven't really gone much further than this, mm -hmm. quite honestly. And mm -hmm. so, and figuring out how many units could we possibly get, where the roads might go, what we need to do for the southern access, you know, sort of the high-level mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Some of the details of would there be some, it is very possible that the, um, uh, that the park, the 42-acre park, might have a, a little store. I don't know. I'm not promising it. I'm just saying none of those decisions have been made, but that's not out of the realm of possibility. Okay. And just overall the density and um, that it is it is really part of the farm, but it's a separate part, segment of it. Um, the farm, when you go there, they do have their green belts. They have the um, their, what do I want to say, their fruit trees, their um, they have different amenities within that where it's not just housing close together and then oh you have to go to see open space you have to go so far away it's you know just integrated throughout the the area so um, I you know would hope that that would be a consideration as you're moving forward that there would be throughout that feel uh, and actual open view viewpoints throughout um, you know this is just you're asking for our input and so I'm just laying it out there and, and that's um, very, it's very helpful to understand what you're thinking about uh, again it's early days so now is the time to hear that that sort of comment because the plan is so so much in its infancy mm -hmm. that those sort of considerations can be incorporated right. a year from now if you had said that 
that would, would turn into a potential problem for us mm -hmm. because we've made some commitments or whatever. Right now, it's all very flexible, so yeah, know, and, very, very timely. And then the amount of medium-high density residential, um, the what's currently in place, the higher density is along Bundy Canyon corridor, so they have that noise to consider. And um, you know, this is this is a whole community up off of the road. You're actually designing the road. You have a lot of freedom with what you're doing, um, and I, the increase from looking at 1,200 to over 2,000, I, and I realize it's been said multiple times that, oh, it won't really be that many, but it still is what, you, if, if that would be passed, you have that, if the constraints work, it could be a lot of dwelling units up there, and I, and I think that's a little higher than our community ambitions, especially since it is a high fire area. So. And, and again, uh, the, the com Planning Commission, staff, and the City Council will have multiple opportunities to comment, criticize, and control what ultimately gets mm -hmm. developed here, what the specific plan ultimately looks like. Yeah. Uh, the, well, I do want to mention one thing about the MHDR and the, H and the M uh, MDR, is that we're all, we're, all, we're all thinking, and right now, we're all talking about single-family homes. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about any high-density development, we're not talking about any apartments, any townhomes. It's all single-family homes. The MHDR represents just some smaller lot sizes that come out in that, des in that density of designation. So it's, uh, while it is a little denser, uh, it's important, uh, we believe, to provide opportunities, homeowning opportunities, to people in a wide range of economic circumstances. Not everybody wants to or can afford to live on a large lot. And therefore, by providing a, a wide range of housing opportunities, you create a, 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 different, um, a different patchwork of your community. Mm -hmm. and we think that's important. Okay, and when you were mentioning active adults, is, is that what we would have called in the past senior housing? <laughs> No, act, active adult is 55 plus. Okay. So it's age restricted 55 plus community. So, part of the development, uh, part of the design process will be uh, putting together uh, the the uh, planning areas so that it's possible that in the future, if, if the developer wanted to incorporate a, a active adult or uh, 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 active adult age restricted, sorry, I couldn't think of that. The age restricted community, the design of the project would allow that meaning that it could be segregated from the standpoint of gates or something like that. And I'm sure I have another question, but I can't think of it at the moment. So I'm glad to hear you say that you're not looking at condos and apartments and townhomes. I think that's very important. I think it's important that we um, keep the um, sites and plan consistent with what's in that area. It is rural. Keep that, please. Very important. Uh, medium high density. It's not something that should be up there, unless it may be for the senior area. That makes sense. Um, thank you for coming to the committee ahead of time and asking for the input. And thank you to the community for showing up and expressing your opinions for what's going on up there. It's really important that you continue to meet with them and the homeowners and the property owners up in that area. Um, and get their input on it. I think it would be a much better project and accepted much better in the community if as we get a lot of their input on it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Schnell. Um, <clears throat> I believe if the roads are good, I'm good with it. Mm -hmm. um, right now, <clears throat> Bundy Canyon, Cook, and Baxter, well, I'd like to see some work on Baxter. I'd like to see some, see some work on George. That's the primary road going up to what you're calling Sunset. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes right by an elementary school I do know well. <clears throat> as far as the active community, uh, so-called senior living, the city of Rancho Bernardo has a, a great deal of that in there, and I've seen some wonderful plans. So I like that type of architecture. And myself, I'd like to thank the community for being here as well. <coughs> As would I. <laughs> so it's very helpful to hear from people early on in the process. That's it's super helpful. I can't emphasize how helpful it is, because again, a year from now, if someone comes to, well, why didn't you do? Why didn't you ask for it? 
Okay, so um, open space water, what does that look like? Is that like a retaining basin? Is it a, it, does it have to do with just the... It, it's, type? it's, in this particular case, it's a combination of existing um, drainage and water quality management facility of some type. Again, we're very early in the stage of design. We don't know how big it's going to be exactly, how exactly what it's going to look like, but we know we need one, and that's the place where all the water goes. So that's that's why it's there. But mostly rain collection. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, personally, I agree that uh, the medium high density is a little extensive. Uh, if it was reduced, it would make it much more palatable. Also, the high density, the, the medium density that's along the northern border, uh, since you have a lot of ranch properties in through there in the Menifee area, if it buffered to cover for that, so those people weren't staring right into immediate wall of backyards, that would make it much more palatable as well. Uh, I do like the, the multiple roads. I, the creation of the one to tie it into the Clinton Keith side is something that the community's needed for a long time, so that's a good thing. Um, but at this point, there's not enough data to really for me to totally support it, but at the same time, it does have positive aspects. It really does. So, and, and again, the the purpose of I don't want to speak for the staff, but the purpose of the meeting is just for you to say, yeah, show me more, because if you said no tonight and, and, and the city council said no, then we basically don't have an opportunity to show you anymore. So that's the, that's what I'd ask you to do is to tell the city council that you think you'd like to see more. I think I would. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I think for the good of the commission and for the public, there was one item that came up a few times tonight that I don't know was adequately addressed, um, and that's one of a fire station. Um, and working with Cal Fire and their strategic planning group, a fire station has been uh, designated as needed on the um, east side of the freeway, somewhere along Clinton Keith Road. Um, we are thinking that it could be somewhere um, between Elizabeth and Salida del Sol um, as a primary site. Um, a site has been at least blocked out on um, a portion of um, uh, Peggy Lane and Susan Lane just north of La Estrella um, as a potential site. Um, no plans further than just citing that has, has occurred. Um, developments like this is what funds for future fire stations and so I just wanted to let the public know there has been strategic planning there is a plan for a future fire station on the east side. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional commissioner discussion? No I just want to reiterate when I send it to the city to just really um, keep the Density, the high density and medium density, I should say, down to a minimum, a very low minimum. I think we need to keep it um, more of the ranch rural, large lots, acreage. I agree. As much as possible. Have we provided enough data for staff? Yes. All right. Then that will close up for 3.1. Then we move to public hearings. Section 2.0, 2.1. Uh, ordinance amendment number 18 03. Okay, yeah, we'll give an exiting break. I'm going to i
So at this point, now I would like to open the public hearing on 2.1. Thank you, Chair. This will be a real quick presentation. Uh, the item before you is a code amendment to prohibit all things cannabis. Uh, this was a direction given by the City Council mm -hmm. at its last Council meeting. Um, as you might be aware, the current moratorium ends in December. So this uh, code amendment is needed uh, to take care of that moratorium. Council will be talking about this particular item next year and provide additional direction to staff to do either continue with the prohibition or come up with some kind of regulations. But at this point, this is um, what this particular code amendment is for. That concludes my comments. All right. Go find my place. Do we have any community speakers on this? I have none, Chair. All right. Well, at this point, I'll close the public hearing. Commission discussion. Well, I agree. Well, I was going to say the um, proposed amendment is consistent with the City of Wilmar General Plan and Zoning Ordinance. That's the findings that, uh, you know, so I still move. Uh, or, or is there others that want to talk about it? Or I do. Yeah, I do. Um, if we don't pass something, uh, then it goes reverts back to the state standard? Correct. Yeah, it leaves us open to all kinds of issues we don't want to deal with. Right. And I understand that from the mayor and several others that they are working towards trying to identify if there's a process, but mostly they're relying on the county. And the county is expending tremendous funds and energy trying to research this. I actually sat down and watched their June meeting, uh, the video of it. It was like five hours long. Mm. I honestly didn't watch all five hours, but I watched a lot of them. Um, they're getting very extensive, and the questions that came from the audience were very impressive. There were questions that needed to be answered before they could make a decision. So I, I know they tried to come back in July, but the amount of questions that came out and the amount of research they were requesting from staff, that just wasn't possible. So hopefully they can get all their data and actually present something back to uh, the county again and possibly get something passed, but at this point, they don't even know where they're going. So if we're relying on them, we've got to do the same thing they've done earlier and just stop everything for the moment. Because they've already got a prohibition going on until they can actually come, <clears throat> come up with the data. Mm -hmm. And I agree with uh, supporting council on this one, and uh, I'm in support of passing. Okay. I make a motion that we um, approve item 2.1, Zoning Ordinance Amendment number 18-3. A second. Your roll call vote. Chairman Lloyd? Yes. Vice Chair Thomas? Aye. Commissioner Langworthy? Aye. Commissioner Strong? Aye. Commissioner Ballard? Aye. Resolution passes by zero. All right. All right, that brings us to 3.2. Tentative parcel map 31736, extension number two. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a time extension that is being brought before you. The site is right behind us at City Hall, uh, to the east, it's that vacant super pad there. It's part of the Oak Springs Ranch uh, community that was approved in the county a long time ago. Uh, the apartments were built uh, like two, three years ago. Uh, they're fully occupied. Uh, but this pad in the middle is for small lot, single family, detached homes. 
So the project was originally approved by the Board of Supervisors back in 2007 as part of a specific plan, 340. As I noted, 312 apartments, they're built and occupied 133, sorry, 103 single family lots. They also, uh, Board of Supervisors also certified an EIR for the entire project and all those mitigation measures still apply. So the track map was originally due to expire in 2010, but the state passed uh, four assembly bills uh, granting seven years of automatic time extensions which moved the new expiration date to 2017. Uh, the PC uh, approved the first EOT for this map uh, in September 2017, which extended it to 2018. That brings us here tonight where the applicant is requesting approval of a three-year time extension to November 20th, 2021. This is the second of three possible time extensions. So this is kind of the layout. It's really small. You can't see it too much, but it's that, that big super pad. Um, the proposed EOT does meet all the findings for approval, and that remains consistent with the uh, VHDR land use designation, as well as the specific plan. Uh, the project uh, remains the same as it does not adversely affect the general health, safety, and welfare. And then the uh, EOT was submitted prior to the actual expiration date. So staff's recommendation is to, for the commission to adopt PC resolution 2018-23, approving a three-year time extension to November 20th, 2021. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Do we have any speakers on this? I have not yet. Oh. All right. Here we have Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. My name is Rob Harris. I'm with the African Nexus Companies. Uh, I just wanted to thank you this evening for uh, looking at this item, and thank you for Matt and the entire staff for their work on this. Uh, nothing to add to the staff report, but I'm here to answer any questions. Have you had any movement going forward on this? Uh, we have. I mean, it's, it's been a, a moving target, and that's why we're here asking for a three-year extension, because we don't want to have to come back you know, one year again and one year again. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been talking to numerous public and private home builders. Um, their, their temperature changes on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, a year ago, larger lots were more favorable. They were slowing down small lot uh, interest. Mm -hmm. uh, now with interest rates rising the way the market is, mm -hmm. the interest level is actually back on smaller lots now because it's more affordable for first-time home buyers. These homes would be uh, under the FHA current limits. Mm -hmm. um, so now there's kind of a renewed interest, which is exciting. So we're hopeful this will move forward quickly, but um, we've heard that before, so we just want to uh, be as realis realistic as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was my question. All right. Any discussion or motion? It's just general business. Oh. It's not public hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're good. So shall, if nobody wants to discuss it, we can make a motion. Mm -hmm. I'm all up for moving that we approve an extension of time. I second. Uh, mm -hmm. Roll call vote. Sorry, Chairman. <laughs> yeah, some notes, sorry. Uh, Chairman Lloyd. Aye. Vice Chairman Thomas. Aye. Commissioner Langworthy. Aye. Commissioner Strong. Aye. Commissioner Bow. Aye. Let's go. Passes 5 0. All right, that moves us to 3.3 .3, tentative track map <clears throat> 33543, extension number 3. Yes, good evening, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. This evening we have extension of time number three for tentative track map number 33543. The project is located on the southwest corner of Cherry Street and Waite Street. It's approximately about 2.37 acres in size. The map was first approved by the Brissette County Board of Supervisors on September 12th of 2006 to subdivide the 2.3 acre site into 10 parcels for single-family residential development. The map was originally due to record on September 12th of 2009. However, it received the automatic seven-year uh, time extensions from uh, state legislature. 
Uh, this resulted in a new expiration date of September 12, 2016. Uh, if you recall, the Commission approved the first time extension on August 3rd of 2016, which extended the map to September 12th of 2017. The Commission, uh, also the Commission approved uh, the second extension of time on August 4th of 2017, which extended it to September 22nd of 2018. Uh, now the applicant is requesting the approval of the third time extension. Uh, this would extend the expiration date uh, to September 12th of 2020. Uh, the applicant uh, submitted the required application in the fee on August 15th of this year, uh, which meant the expiration date. Uh, the applicant will now have one final two-year extension of time left before the map becomes null and void. Here is a, a picture of the tentative track map. The proposed extension of time does meet the required findings for approval in that the map remains uh, consistent with the general plan land use designation, which is MDR. It remains consistent with the R1 development standards. It does not adversely affect the general health, safety, and welfare of the public. And the applicant did submit the, extent, the <clears throat> third extension of time and paid the fees prior to the September 22nd, 2018 expiration date. Therefore, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt PC Resolution 2018-24, approving a two-year extension of time to September 12, 2020, uh, noting that all original conditions of approval and requirements of the approved phasing agreement and CEQA MND mitigation measures will still remain in full force and effect. And that concludes my presentation and staff is available for any questions. I have a question. You mentioned there's another extension. Is that in addition to this extension? Yes. Okay, so they actually can go to 20, 22? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is the applicant present? I do not see the applicant or their engineer present this evening. Okay. Any public speaker? I do not have any public speakers. Oh. Any discussion on this ancient project? <laughs> if I may add, um, the applicant has submitted uh, construction plans to the engineering department, and they're working with staff on their improvement plans right now. So there is some forward motion. There is some forward motion. Like that. I won't pick on that. <laughs> I make a motion that we approve um, tentative track map 33543 for their third extension. Okay, before you, I just want to put in my two cents word. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that the applicant isn't here. I had hoped to just, um, you know, I know it's, it's not a con condition of the extension of time, but just an observation. Um, looking at the map that um, you know, I, I would have hoped to encourage the uh, applicant to consider redesign because those five of the lots front onto uh, Waite Street. And if you look down, it, there's a lot of traffic that goes down that road just to avoid the freeway. They circle around, and um, those are probably, they're fairly small lots that uh, go on to Waite, and so you know, for ingress and egress on those, it would be, um, you know, not as optimal as in 20, whenever this was first approved by the county. So um, just a, you know, a consideration for the uh, developer, but not, you know, it has not, it's not a condition of the extension of time, but just kind of my two cents of what I see, um, you know, from my perspective. So that's, that's all. Can you pull the layout of it? Bottom half goes to the cul-de-sac. Right, so we have Waite Street. Yeah. If the, you can kind of see the cursor move there, right? Mm -hmm. Like Knight Rider, right? And here we have uh, Cherry. So yeah. we have the five lots that are fronting Waite, and the uh, remaining five lots will be accessed via cul-de-sac entrance, which will be perpendicular to Cherry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was only my only observation. So if the, yeah. 
Um, what do you think of putting the cul-de-sac in the middle? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's not my call to make. It, you know, no, but I'm, I'm suggestion. Yeah. Just, just to be aware of what the neighborhood looks like if you pull back and look at the other lots along there, the neighboring um, areas don't have houses that front onto Wade Street or they have bigger lots where you pull in, you circle around and head out. So just just an observation, but um, you know. For the good of the order, um, when we do get the final site plan of development, we can share these concerns with the applicant. And at that time, maybe there's opportunities to do half circular driveways so that people are always going forward when they come in and come out. Yeah, the, if the applicant had to <coughs> absorb the entire cul-de-sac, uh, would it make the parcels too small for this type of a project? Well, it's hard to say without pulling out a scale and a ruler. Right. Yeah. But it right. would be a lot different. It would yeah. be smaller for sure. So yeah. it's, it's just a observation to share with the applicant because, um, you know, this is something that should have been built out years ago. Um, so... Back when things were a little slower. Yeah. All right. So, so we have a motion. <clears throat> a motion to approve. No, oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> you can second it. I'll second it. <laughs> Roll call vote. Chairman Lloyd. Aye. Vice Chairman Thomas. Aye. Commissioner Langworthy. Aye. Commissioner Strong. Aye. Commissioner Ballard. Aye. Resolution has five zero. All right, and that will move us to 3.4, the single family residential guideline. Thank you, Chair. So I have just kind of a brief presentation on this. Um, just a quick background. Uh, when we incorporated, we inherited the county's uh, single family residential design guidelines, which we have been using and implementing over the last 10 years. All residential projects uh, comply with the design guidelines. Back in 20, I believe it's 2014, uh, the county, or 2015, the county amended their design guidelines to address vinyl fencing for interior property lines on single family residential tracks. So part of this revision that we're bringing forward is, is to do that. Uh, part of the second uh, thing is, you know, you saw the strikeout version that we had and, and the clean version is to, is to get, um, some of the references to the county off while still giving them claim to fame that it was their original you know, set of guidelines, that, which I think are, are very good. Uh, we have had no intention to bring forward a comprehensive um, design guidelines. As you know, we're working on commercial design guidelines, and I'll put a little plug in. We're going to have a December 5th study session. That'll be the only thing on the item for that as we move forward on the commercial design guidelines. But in the staff report, I've summarized the changes. A lot of them are striking out the county, striking out board of supervisors, putting in the city, city council, so on and so forth. So uh, with that, I uh, would recommend that the council or commission uh, adopt PC resolution 2018-25 recommending city council approval of these uh, minor changes. And just for the record, too, we did receive a letter from, or an email from uh, Mr. Don Saunders asking about some of the development standards for uh, wall heights as well as he would prefer to see no wood alternative all in our design guidelines. That concludes my comments. All right. Do we have any public speakers on this? I have none, Chair. All right. Commission discussion? I like wood. Yeah. Now, and this has to deal with new construction, and it does, and it doesn't apply. Does it not apply to like if someone remodels has to do plans for their property? Would that be a contingency? Would it have to go through? No, the guidelines, if I'm not mistaken, Fred, maybe you can help remember. Um, it applies to subdivisions of ten or more lots. I think something like that, right? Correct. Right. So if you have under 10 lots, or if you've got a single parcel that you're building a home, we do apply some of the guidelines just because they're good guidelines, but they're not applicable in the sense that you can't make a homeowner put in shutters on their 
single family home. Okay, and so if they have a half acre lot and they want to keep their animals in the half acre lot, they can put their barbed wire up to keep their critters in and is well, that Yeah, that kind of fencing isn't involved in the single that, Okay, I just want to make sure there wasn't any conflict on that. It's, it's all about the critters. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'm an animal lover too, so I can see where you're coming from. Uh, it's good to see that you have these guidelines moving forward, and uh, it doesn't apply to people who already have been living here and have their house built. So I like that. Thank you. I think the changes are appropriate. I I like the the new information that's in there, and I'm glad we're upgrading our existing guidelines to where there are guidelines. Yeah, it's always a good thing. Yeah. Um, there was this question about the um, fence height. Is it just the front yard? The about the comment number one about it, you know, five foot being too low. Six, you know, because I I do have a friend that lives with a slope in his yard, and he's six foot tall, and he doesn't want to see what's in the neighbor's yard. So um, yeah, the maximum wall height universally in the city is six feet. Okay. So you can propose three feet, you can propose up to six feet. Typically, interior side and rear property lines, you'll see six foot fencing. Occasionally, some of the older tracks, you'll see five and a half. Okay. And then we do have provisions uh, for walls in, in the required front yards and side yards, which are like three and a half feet. And then you also have the ability, if it needed to be a sound barrier, for some reason or another, to make it taller. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, whenever we do noise studies on, on new tracks, if the mitigation measures require a, a higher wall, then that does not violate these standards. That is a mitigation measure that has to be implemented. A good example of that is the Oak Creek Canyon project um, within the farm that we were mentioning earlier. They have eight foot walls along Bundy Canyon right. as a noise, help it with noise reduction. Absolutely. Thank you. Very good. I make a motion that we pass PC resolution 2018-25. Second. A motion and a second. Roll call vote. Chairman Lloyd. Aye. Vice Chairman Thomas. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Langworthy. Aye. Commissioner Strong. Aye. Commissioner Ballard. Aye. Resolution passes. Aye, sir. All right. And this is two planning communications. Do you have any communications? <coughs> no. All right, then move to planning director report. I don't have any, oops, excuse me. I don't have anything specific. We will have a commission meeting next month on November 7th. We have quite a few items. Um, then we'll have the design guidelines, um, the commercial design guidelines, a study session with the commission and the public on December 5th. Very good. City attorney report. I don't have anything to report this evening. Nothing fun. I know. Quiet <laughs> tonight. Uh, does anyone have a future agenda item they'd like to push for? Then that's an adjournment at 743.